Sharon Mitchell is Cora's financial controller corporate. She joined Cora's after 12 years with Telecom and she's been closely involved in the financial separation of the two companies. Uh, since the demerger, she's led Chorus in establishing their corporate finance function and she's been integral in the separation of the financial systems from Telecom with Chorus's own enterprise resource system going live July 1 this year. So please welcome Sharon Mitchell. Chorus has been on a bit of a journey for the last sort of three odd years and we really need to go back to the period before and around Emerger to understand quite where we've come from. So I think you all know how Chorus was born but I'll just whistle through the time up to Demerger and set the scene for why we've decided to tackle financial reporting in the way that we did. So in September 2009 the government announced the ultra fast broadband investment initiative and part of Telecom choosing to take part in that was the understanding that Chorus would separate from Telecom. So in May 2011, Crown Fibre Holdings um, approved the deal and gave Chorus 24 of the 33 candidate areas. So in the period from May to November 2011, Chorus demerged from Telecom. Um, and the six months from May to November were quite a turning point for me. Um, and how I thought about external reporting. So I'd been involved in external reporting in telecom for quite a number of years, and we'd pulled together annual reports, and they were beautiful. There was 150-odd pages of everything you could ever possibly want to know about the company. Um, and on more than one occasion, these reports got um, got awards from all sorts of different people, so we figured, well, they must be good, and they must be what you follow in order to do things well. Um, and after that, I got involved in pulling together the accounting separation information for Telecom, which was largely a compliance exercise that the Commerce Commission said that we had to do prior to the merger. So what this was was going through and building the world's most detailed model to try and pull apart a company that's really, really complex and then try and somehow explain what you've done. So the output of that was about 300 odd pages of a accounting separation document and there's probably about 20 people in New Zealand that read it. So that was very fulfilling from my point of view. <laughs> so then when we came to Demerger we had to create a document that created all the pros and cons associated with the Demerger and with a big chunk of mandatory disclosures included. So we had the Demerger booklet and if you're a telecom shareholder you will recall getting this little beast coming gently fluttering through your letterbox. So I was involved in creating some of the 520 odd pages that's in this wee booklet. Um, I authored 105 pages of it and co-authored another 66 pages of it. The carve-outs were required, which is the 105 pages, from a compliance perspective in order to show the investors and shareholders what the new company would look like. But it didn't actually present an accurate picture of what the two demerged entities would be. And meanwhile, the pro forma financial statements were included on a voluntary basis, but they gave a much more realistic picture of what the two companies, when they split apart, would actually be. So it really seemed to be an imbalance in my mind between what we needed to include from a compliance perspective with that information that was truly meaningful to the reader. And so then if you start thinking about this little beast in total, so I had about 170 odd pages head start on the average reader. And yet when I put on my shareholder hat and was asked to vote on whether or not I thought that this was a good idea, I honestly couldn't hand on heart say that I read maybe more than about another 50 odd pages. And I know that probably a dozen of those were the pictures that had all of the directors and the exec on it. And so this is from somebody who had a head start on your average reader and it's the biggest decision in this company's recent history. So if stakeholders aren't reading documents that are this important, then really, what are they going to, to read? And very purposefully, the, um, the people that were putting together this little thing even wrote on the front cover, vote in support, because they knew that most people probably wouldn't turn the front page. So after having four years of putting together output that really wasn't getting read, it got me thinking about whether more information is necessarily better and whether or not we could do something a little bit different. And are the annual reports that we pull together really all that different to this demerger booklet? So do our stakeholders actually read what we publish? And are we presenting information that our stakeholders actually want? Or simply following what's always been done? 
or could we do something different? So roll on a few months, to merger happened and in June 2012, Chorus had to create its first set of financial statements. We were lucky because we were in a really unique situation. We had a completely blank sheet of paper to start with. We had analysts and investors that were really, really interested in what we had to say and getting to grips with the drivers in our business and trying to figure out once it had all settled, what was actually where. And we had a management team that were keen to forge a business that had its own unique feel and approach. So what was our approach and where do we start? We knew that the only information out in the market was what was contained in the demerger booklet. So there'd have to be a degree of explaining what the business is and how it all fitted together no matter what we did. We also wanted to pull together information that was transparent and that people would read. And we knew there'd be a degree of translation in what we did because our first period was going to be seven months. And what was in the demerger booklet was 12 months. So you had to somehow interpret between the two. And underneath it all, we believed that we had a really simple business. Pretty much dig some holes, chuck some fib fibre in, put blinky bits on the end to make it work, and you have a phone network. It's not quite that simple, but you get how we kind of think about things. So being brave with a kind of half-formed idea, we started thinking through what we would do to communicate the results in a simple way whilst making them excellent. We decided really early on that we needed to have all of the documents relating to year end complementing each other. So to achieve this, the financial statements, the management commentary and the investor presentation are written together to consistently explain the results of the business. In addition, we made a conscious decision that the information which is presented to stakeholders each six months would be the same as what management sees every month. It's what management views is important, and therefore we figure it will be important to shareholders as well. The revenue and expense categories that we present are a bit different to your traditional statutory categories, but what are, they are what is meaningful to us and to our business. The balance sheet's categorised to reflect our business and the unique relationship that we have with Crown Fibre Holdings. And the metrics that we chose to gauge performance were deliberately chosen to be the ones that would remain relevant for a number of years such as CAPEX, cost per premise passed, and cost per premise connected, so as to present some consistent information and use the information that managers, management holds itself accountable and not letting statutory reporting shield management from the results, even if they are bad. We decided that our annual report wasn't going to be a marketing document. The art department can have the rest of the internet to play and that the annual report was going to tell the story of the business without any embellishments. And we also really wanted to differentiate ourselves from where we'd come. So what do we actually do? So in the financial statements, we disclosed only what needed to be disclosed. We went through and removed everything from the accounts that didn't involve choice. So if the accounting standards say that you have to do something a certain way, there's no point putting in the financial statements, you've done it that way, because really you had no choice. And we decided to pull all our related information together so we put the accounting policies in the same note and we put the depreciation in with the fixed assets because that gives you both halves of the same coin. So when you read the fixed asset note, you've got the policies, the actual assets and the depreciation all there together. We put the notes that would, most people would be interested in first rather than following the traditional P&L and balance sheet format and running through that way. So therefore we have network and intangible assets first because we are a network business. We've got debt coming next because that's what's funding the network build and then we've got CFH and Crown funding notes following after that because that's the other half of what our debt funding is. Everything else then follows on in due course. We cut right down on jargon so we decided as much as possible to avoid acronyms and we'd speak in really plain English. We wouldn't not speak plainly, so we would actively take out all double negatives whenever we find them, and we'd rewrite all clumsy explanations to be straightforward and simple. So then on to the management commentary. We aim to stay away from uh, this is up or down by X dollars or X percentage type commentary and really focus on what the story's about. We believe that that would then tell what the numbers are actually doing, if you've got explained the trends underneath them. We th thought that this would help stakeholders not only understand what the trends were, but where they might be heading in the future. We made sure we didn't say something just for the sake of it. So, for example, the commentary around the cash flows were removed because it really didn't aid, aid the understanding of the business. 
We knew we had to translate from what the Demerge book said to what we were now presenting. So we included an appendix in the ma to the management commentary to explain our underlying earnings. In the first year that this meant that we excluded some one-off items for insurance receipts that we got relating to the Canterbury earthquakes, and also then annualising our seven-month results to provide commentary on the difference between these and the pro forma demerger numbers in the demerger booklet. In subsequent years, we've continued to get a little bit of insurance receipts year in and year out. Hopefully, we've nearly got to the end of that. Um, we could have left that in revenue and just said, oh, I've got a couple of million extra dollars of revenue, but we felt that to be consistent and to be open and honest, we would continue to remove that revenue because it's not underlying and it's not then the true business that we've had during the year. So what's the result of all of this? Well, we've got a really concise reporting package that we think clearly articulates the trends and results for the business. It outlines what's going well and what isn't doing so well. And you do all of that in less than 20 pages for the management commentary and less than 40 pages for the financial statements which when it comes to reviewing all of this at the end of the process is a whole bunch better than the alternative. And most importantly, our financial reporting remains a work in progress. We continue to look at ways to improve what we're doing and how we're presenting the information. Is there a simpler way of explaining something? Could we present it in a different way? Are we remaining true to our values? We know we all have to add in disclosures and comments here and there as the years go by, but we're very mindful of not losing the simplicity that we've worked so hard to achieve. So we continue to question the validity of what we've presented before. This year we've changed the format of a number of tables to be more concise and more thorough in the presentation of that information and more clearly reflecting the movements and the balances. But importantly, the fundamentals of the reports have remained the same for the last three years. Um, we had the green light from management to be a little bit different. Um, so by standing up and putting forward your own ideas, it's normal practice at Chorus across all levels of the business. So for management, there was very much a sense of just stop talking about it and get on and get it done. Um, it'd be fair to say that I was very nervous when we were proposing this new style of financial statements to our board. Our audit committee um, has got three accountants on it, so I don't recommend that to anybody if you have the choice. <laughs> and they're all really, really smart accountants at that, so a really tough audience. Um, at first glance, and this was well before year end, the overall feedback from the audit committee was supportive although with a degree of nervousness and trepidation. I recall a comment of, oh, I can't find anything when in relation to the ordering of the notes when it was first glanced at. But come year end and reporting season and the feedback from the board and the audit committee was very positive. All of our board members are involved in numerous other boards. So during reporting season, having less than 60 pages of management commentary and financials to review, yet still having the key messages delivered in a clear and straightforward manner was greatly appreciated. Final test for us was how would our investors, analysts and shareholders respond? We really didn't expect any direct feedback on what we'd published and we were surprised to get a number of analysts and investors providing feedback directly to us. We had comments of very good disclosure to there's good information in the pack and it's refreshing and nice to see the laid, numbers laid out in detail to I really like the reporting style and the level of detail in the management commentary, great work. And your disclosure is amongst the best, if not the best, I get to understand the key value drivers as feedback to us. I have been enormously heartened since we put out our first set of annual report to see a number of other organisations looking at their information that they are presenting in their annual reports with a lot more thought being put into the readability of the financial statements and a significant amount of unnecessary detail being removed. And this can only be good for the clarity and understanding of information provided to stakeholders. I think we as preparer of reports need to keep in mind that a large number of our investors and stakeholders only get to look into our business a couple of times a year. So these communications should clearly and concisely tell the story of how we, the board and management, have run their business for the last six months. And remember that it is their business that we are running, so they need to understand what we're saying. So I'll leave you with the feedback that we had from a large North American fund manager who had been in the game for more than 20 years and was our largest, one of our largest investors at the time. So in his words, I have to say congratulations on the management commentary. It's the clearest, most informative and simplest commentary I've ever read. The revenue accounts are logical and informative, the expense accounts are simple but provide real information. I don't normally flatter management and I don't think I've ever congratulated anyone on financial statements. Not surprising. Gora's statements 
set a blow for readability and transparency, so please pass on my appreciation. Needless to say, I was blown away to get that kind of feedback from somebody that you wouldn't normally expect to get any feedback from. So I, with that, I will thank you for your time. Thank you.